Multigreen, building attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily real estate through impact investing. Welcome to the Multigreen Podcast. This episode is part of a series captured live in Washington, D.C. at the Bipartisan Policy Center's Housing Summit. I'm your host, Randy Norton, and today we'll be speaking with Jonathan Reckford, CEO at Habitat for Humanity International. Under his leadership, Habitat organizations have grown from serving 125,000 individuals each year to helping more than 4.2 million people last year alone by building strength, stability, and self-reliance through shelter. Enjoy our conversation. Thank you for being with us today on this Multigreen podcast. My pleasure. Glad to be with you, Randy. We're here in Washington, D.C. for the Bipartisan Policy Center solution for housing today. It's really a supply side topic, it's something you know a lot about. And not a lot of people know this, but you are a global organization doing housing all around the world. So you don't just have a perspective here on the United States, but one that's truly global. You know, I think because we serve in 1,100 communities across the U.S., people know us as their local habitat, but we do serve in 73 countries. And over the last 50 years, have helped uh, almost 39 million people have new or improved housing globally. And sadly, the housing crisis is not just a U.S. issue. We have a global housing crisis as well. How did we get here? You know, I think the great challenge is after the 08 crash and, and housing-led crash, so many small builders uh, were forced out and then banks got narrower in their lending, so they never really came back. The larger production builders did. So we underbuilt for uh, really more than a decade. So depending on whose study you use, we're between three and six million units short and particularly short at the low and moderate end of the market. That was true before COVID. And then COVID really set that on fire. Suddenly, uh, everybody wanted more living space. Uh, suddenly institutions were buying up houses. Suddenly uh, millennials who had delayed family formation suddenly wanted to, uh, to have homes. And really all those pieces drove demand at a time where supply couldn't keep up. Then we had supply constraints uh, that slowed down building. So all of this has uh, led to really extraordinary shortages and therefore we, we've seen are these double digit in some cases 20 30 40 percent increases in markets that were once affordable untenable you've been doing this for 17 years at habitat and have things gotten better or worse you know i think um sad to say from an affordability perspective it's actually gotten worse uh, you know there's some things that are improved but the sad part is if you think about the, you know, Harvard's data, the basic ability for a family to be able to afford uh, to rent or purchase a home at no more than 30% of their income, uh, we've got one in four families that are cost burdened and one in six families now that are severely cost burdened. So paying over half their income on their rent or mortgage. And of course that creates such a squeeze on all the other things we want in terms of health, education, uh, and, uh, and care for your family, food. So it is, uh, it's really become a full out crisis right now. If you're in 1,100 communities and 73 countries and you're delivering housing to the entire population, you probably have a perspective on the supply side uh, issues at hand here. What are you seeing? What are the issues to deliver housing? You know, I think they're on two fronts. One is no question on the material side, we've seen significant inflation. So 20% up, land similar. Uh, you know, we've had so much money pouring into the economy and at, at a world of, of, you know, near zero interest rates for so long, uh, we had an overheated uh, real estate market, I think, clearly, and that squeezes out affordability. It's also become slower and harder to build. So if you think about both supply chain disruptions with COVID and increased regulation, the combination of that has created more risk and that creates more financial risk for developers. And we're a very friendly developer, but we're a developer too. And so it has just uh, driven up our costs substantially. And that is uh, that just makes it harder uh, to bring units out. And of course, at the same time, uh, low-income families' incomes have gone up, but not nearly as fast as the costs have gone up. So the gap for affordability and the ability to make the math work for that family has gotten harder. Through the lens and experience that you've had now for 17 years, are your tactics for delivery changing? Is there experiences that you can point to that are giving you some barometers and indicators of how to move forward? 
Well, one of our, my axioms for a long time is we should be religious about our principles, but not our tactics. And what we're seeing now, and I've heard it from many of our uh, historically affordable markets, is they wish they'd adopted some of our tactics from the high cost markets earlier, because now we're chasing and it's late. So for example, we are looking at uh, more shared equity models, permanent affordability models. It's a compromise. We, we value both the chance for that family to purchase a home and build that intergenerational asset, but also rightly, cities want long-term affordability so that if a family is successful and able to move up or sell their home, uh, the cities want that home to stay affordable. So we're, we're looking at more models where the family gets shared equity and appreciation, but not the windfall. And if they sell the home, they have to sell to another in income qualified family. I think we're going to see more of those creative financing models that will allow it. We're seeing more land trusts uh, where families can purchase the home, but not the underlying land. Our thesis is that cities need to allocate land. One of the fastest ways we could build more are states uh, our cities allocating the land they do have, which could speed up the, the chance to build. Uh, we are also looking at more modular and different ways of doing construction, more partnerships with the private sector. Many of our Habitat affiliates are building mixed income communities, which we think is the right model. We would love more of the private builders to be inviting Habitat into their communities uh, because we know mixed income, mixed use is the best societal model, but we have not designed our zoning for that. So tactics, you have a global perspective. Again, you've had some experience with global catastrophes. How do we deliver more housing supply on the construction solution side? You know, I think um, one of the, it's not a magic bullet, but I think there are a number of things that are promising. Uh, we've seen accessory dwelling units being a quick way to get more density into existing communities of opportunity where it's been very difficult to build any density. I do think land use is a giant piece of this, making it easier and faster to build. And particularly, uh, we just had in the last session talking about uh, Senator Young and, and the yes in my backyard. I think one of the true areas of bipartisan agreement in our country is not in my backyard. And uh, red and blue states, red and blue cities uh, do not welcome uh, you know, mixed income housing. And we've got to change that if, uh, to make it work. So I think um, one side is construction, which I think more modular and more ways of, of leveraging skilled labor. Uh, and we've done some of that in post-disaster environments. I think there are creative mechanisms of building uh, very sm uh, small homes that are designed to be expanded over time, again, which increases affordability. We've got to change the economic zoning where it used to be racially segregated zoning. When, when that was uh, made illegal, it went to economic economically uh, segregated zoning, which is everyone's welcome if you can afford a $350,000 house with a quarter acre lot and, and all the amenities. And what we've got to do is have smart density, density along transit lines, density uh, where we can get, uh, so people have access, not in every neighborhood and every block to mixed income, but within school systems, within districts, so that, that people do have access. Uh, it also is better for the environment, better for traffic, better for uh, overall quality of life as well. How long is it going to take to bring this housing issue back to equilibrium? I fear it's, it's years. There's, uh, unfortunately, it, as we've talked about today, uh, you've got complexity as interest rates go up, that's actually going to make access and affordably, uh, affordability worse. Um, on the flip side, hopefully it will sort of soften uh, the overheated markets in a way that starts to bring values more in the line uh, with incomes. So I think we're going to have to really work on the supply side because if we can, and we're in favor of demand side solutions, but if we do demand side solutions and don't build more units, we're actually going to keep driving prices up. And what we've really got to do is build enough units, especially in growth areas, uh, to make a difference. One, one additional program I'll, I'll talk about shortly that I think could make a real difference on the supply side is the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. This is a bipartisan bill that would be the equivalent for home ownership of the low income housing tax credit, which has worked so well for rental supply. And this would especially, you know, in many cities in the country, they're not booming or part of the city's booming, but another part of the city is left, has been left behind and underinvested in over the years. The dilemma there is you can buy a home for an affordable price, but after you invest in upgrading it to code or bringing it up to standard, it won't appraise for the cost of that upgrade. So this would be a tax credit, federal tax credit, that would actually help close the gap between the cost to rehab the house and then the, uh, the appraisal value to sell to another family. So we think we could actually preserve a lot of housing and be able to sell those homes to, uh, to families. Another good federal tactic that we've heard about uh, and are excited is HUD is going to take more of their portfolio of housing and put it back into the nonprofit market versus just auctioning it to the private market. That again could put uh, thousands of additional units of housing at the affordable level back into the market. So I think it's gonna take all of the above. 
What is your message today to our audience and constituency outside these doors? Well, the first message is why. And I think one of the communication gaps is that so many people in positions of influence and power have never experienced poor housing. And so it's been an invisible uh, crisis. And I think we see people experiencing homelessness. That's only the tip of the iceberg for all the people who are living in uncrowded, unsafe conditions, commuting long distances. And if you think about your rent or mortgage as your cost of housing plus your utilities plus the cost to get to work, um, families are getting crushed right now by inflation. So one of the best ways to mitigate inflation is actually to build more housing. Because until we actually increase the supply of housing, uh, it's going to be very tough to get the consumer price index down because housing represents about 30 percent of the consumer price index. So housing supply is important to the inflation argument. It's important to the economic argument. It's really important to the foundation of what all of us want for our families. And what I've seen is um, I think in some ways housing is so visible now because middle class families, children can't afford housing. So suddenly the invisible crisis has become visible, but it was there already. And you know, I think what we know, whether it is in Cambodia or Malawi or Atlanta or uh, in California, housing is uh, not the only need, but in many ways it's the prerequisite for everything else we need in life. If you, you know, a child grows up in safe, stable housing, she does better in school, she stays healthy, uh, she is set on a path to be able to be, uh, to, uh, be independent um, and provide for herself. If you pull housing out of that, health outcomes go down, educational outcomes go down, and we see uh, families caught in this uh, spiral. And so for us, certainly not the only need, but as a society, um, you know, as, as Ron said at the beginning of the day, uh, Fair Housing Act was passed a very long time ago. In 1949, we said every family should have safe, decent, affordable housing in decent communities. And um, we have not lived up to that promise in this country or certainly any country in the world. Well, we need to do better. We want to do better with organizations like Habitat for Humanity, international and domestic. We are doing better. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for telling the story. Thank you for listening. Join us as we build 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes by 2030. And if you like the content you're hearing, hit the subscribe button. Follow us at Think Multigreen and sign up to learn more at www.multi.green.